dear colleagues and friends, dear students, dear members of the Serbian Association for Earthquake Engineering, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Miroslav Marjanovic and I serve as a Vice Dean for Science and Research at the Faculty of Civil Engineering of the University of Belgrade. I'm honored to welcome you today to our faculty on behalf of the faculty board and our Dean, Professor Vlada Kuzmanovic. Faculty of Civil Engineering has a long-lasting tradition, lasting for 175 years, from 1846, when the engineering school was established. Through the years, the faculty was growing and developing, and from 1931, so almost a century, we are located in this beautiful building. Uh, the last year was the anniversary year for our faculty, and we celebrated it through a number of activities. One of the very important activities for us was the election of a number of uh, guest professors of our faculty. So our cooperation with the guest professor Veljko Milutinović uh, from the University of Purdue resulted in today's lecture of our distinguished guest, Professor Ihan Ifanoglu from the University of Purdue. Uh, the main teaching and research activities and interests of our guests are related to structural engineering with a focus on structural dynamics, earthquake engineering, engineering seismology, and classical as well, and simulation-based structural analysis. Once more, I would like to welcome Professor Ifanoglu to our faculty, and I now invite Professor Marko Marinković to address some words on behalf of the Serbian Association of Earthquake Engineering. Thank you. I'm glad that you took your time to come here and um, hear some, something new, something that maybe you already know but in a different way and to learn something and improve your knowledge and skills in the field of structural engineering but also particle engineering. We have today a really special chance to welcome Professor Irfanoglu from Purdue University and I will give a short overview of his uh, really uh, impressive biography. So, uh, 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 Professor Irfanoglu is professor and uh, associate head of civil engineering uh, in the Lille School of Civil Engineering at Purdue University, Indiana, USA. He holds a bachelor deg degree from the Middle East uh, Technical uh, University in Ankara, Turkey, and master degree in civil engineering and PhD from the California Institute of Technology. Prior to joining Purdue University in 2005, he worked as consulting engineer at Viz, Jenny and Esler Associates in Emerville, California. His main teaching and research interests are related to structural engineering with focus on structural dynamics, earthquake engineering, earthquake uh, engineering seismolo seismology, and classical as well as, as well as simulation-based structural analysis. Starting with 1944, uh, 1994 uh, Northridge, California earthquake, he participated in several reconnaissance uh, earthquakes from Turkey, Haiti, Taiwan, Mexico, and so on. He is the member of the American Concrete Institute Disaster Reconnaissance Committee and the member of the Secretary of the Simplified Design of Concrete Buildings Committee. He is also a member of the Earthquake Engineering Association of Turkey, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute in USA, Seismological Society of America, and American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, Dr. Ishwanoglu is associate editor of the ASCE Journal of Performance of Constructed Facilities and Frontiers in Built Environment Earthquake Engineering. And we are glad from the uh, Faculty of Civil Engineering to welcome and also from the Serbian Association of Earthquake Engineering to continue with the lectures of distinguished professors from practice and research and from teaching from all over the world. And I'm glad that uh, we will hear today a nice lecture topic of drift de uh, driven design assessment and let's say some hints and tips from the professor in this direction. So please welcome Professor Fanon. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marikovic. And um, I would like to start by saying first, uh, I'm most pleased to be here. It's an honor to be here. I was hoping to come a couple of years ago, but uh, you know what COVID did to us. And thank you for taking your time on, uh, on a Friday afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the Faculty of Civil Engineering here at the University of Belgrade, uh, uh, Dean uh, Professor Kuzmanovic, and um, Vice Dean uh, Professor Mark Marinovic and Professor uh, Marko Marinkovic, and the Serbian Association for Earthquake Aging for inviting me to give this lecture. And um, over the next uh, several minutes, I would like to share with you what I know, a part of what I know, uh, but uh, so I'd like to encourage you to ask questions um, and please don't worry about the language barrier. Professor Marinkovic has volunteered to translate if you don't feel like asking in English. That'll be all right. I, I, I don't know, unfortunately, Serbian. Uh, I know Zdravo and Hvala, Hvala Vam. That's pretty much where I stop. Uh, but um, maybe next time I'll improve a bit better. Um, so I would like to, uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, um, colleagues that mentored me and helped me, and as well as uh, several slides that you will see shared. Um, one of them is Professor Sozan, um, lead mentor, and I will show a little bit more about him and, the, um, and other colleagues. Now, you will hear uh, Professor Sozan, uh, who comes from a, a school of thought uh, of Hardy Cross, of the Mom distribution method, and uh, Newmark, Nate Newmark, of the Newmark's beta method, if you are familiar with it in structural dynamics. Uh, he comes from that, and unfortunately, we lost him in 2018. He was a wonderful teacher, and uh, I had the great pleasure of working with him for several years. And um, over his, uh, late in his lifetime, he published a couple of books. One at the uh, more intro to structural analysis, and uh, more like a beginning of structural mechanics and structural analysis, uh, understanding structures. And the second book is on the reinforced concrete, the principles of reinforced concrete design. I highly recommend you, if you are into particular reinforced concrete design, the second one, because it looks at things from a point of view of uh, uh, behavior. Now, uh, all of his, uh, before he retired, he retired in 2016, and before he retired, we asked him to share with us the notes and the books and the references he prefers, and he gave us um, about 400 papers and other things, and not really from him, um, from other colleagues. All of those papers, all of those references are uploaded, scanned, uploaded to this website uh, down there. Uh, if you search Google for Metasozen Digital Library, uh, they'll be available. Uh, everything's available in the PDF. Now, at the time of his passing, um, we were writing a book with him, with Dr. Bujol, Santiago Bujol. Um, unfortunately, um, after uh, at about third, cha third chapter, that's when, when we lost him. So we decided to honor the promise, and uh, we gathered the drafts and then added some other additional work uh, from his past work with his students. Uh, he always gave credit to his students. He never took credit. And then we also added his class notes uh, and published the book just recently. Uh, there's a copy of it with uh, Professor Marinkovic. So if you in the audience, the students, if you're interested in having a look at it, I, I'm sure he would be delighted to sh share with you. And I think there will be a copy with uh, Koran Miltonovic, who is one of your undergraduate here. By the way, Koran uh, represented the University of Belgrade at Purdue University very honorably, and we are most impressed. So based on his, that one data that we have, I can tell you that you have an excellent program here. Uh, and, and I think Koran could uh, share the book with uh, professionals if need be. Now, without uh, further, let me, I think we are all familiar with the fact that uh, the world has many hazards, uh, natural or otherwise, and one of them uh, is the earthquake hazard. And uh, if we look, focus more on the, our neighborhood here, uh, obviously we are at uh, major hazards. Uh, they, the, the numbers are not that important, but uh, the more red, the color looks, the darker it looks, the more hazardous or the seismologists tell us that we are more at risk of experiencing high intensity ground shaking. So in this setting, I want to share with you how 
earthquake engineers approach um, design to some extent and what are the key issues. Now there are two goals, two major goals in seismic design of buildings. The first one and ultimately the most important one is to protect the occupants. You do not want your structure to collapse. You do not want to lose elevation of your uh, floors. Life safety is utmost importance. You may lose everything else, but not life. Now, uh, this happens, unfortunately, at every earthquake, more or less uh, intense shaking, and uh, and some of them cost uh, many many lives. Now, this is the first objective. I'll tell you what we need to do about this. Uh, the second objective is to we need to protect the investment. So your structure might not have collapsed but it might have lost value totally. Uh, you have to abandon the structure practically, or it will cost you so much that uh, you wished you had spent the money up front, perhaps a fraction of it. So what to do? To protect the, again, the occupants, we need to uh, make sure that there's no instability, displacement uh, induced instabilities. And to do that, we need to do ductile design, whether it's reinforced concrete or steel, structural steel design, uh, you need to design the detail of your structure such that it could take a lot of large deformations without falling apart. At the end, and if you have that, you may see some signs of what we call damage or evidence of you know, inelastic behavior, but your structure will be fine. Uh, that's, that's really the goal. By the way, there's, it's very important also to pay attention to the architectural details, which I'm not going to go into in this uh, presentation, but you need to make sure that the structure that you design is the structure that is built, um, not with architectural features that changes the character of your structure such that your columns are, for example, are kept from moving, flexing freely. You will, you, you will be actually, um, in, you could have a very different structure. Now, to protect the investment, as you remember from that photo perhaps, uh, you should avoid the distortion of, in your structure as much as uh, possible. You need to limit the story distortions. Uh, to what level? It actually turns out the level typically not what we design for, typically to 2% of the story height. That's typical design. Uh, it's, it's actually the architectural limit. You should not lose your architectural walls, infill walls, because if you do that, the cost will be prohibitively high. How do you do that? Well, you proportion your structures and the elements, structural elements that provide this lateral resistance or stiffness such that the distortion is limited. And I will, I'll tell you how you could do, try this thing uh, because it looks like, well, I, I, how am I, where am I going to start? But before I start, I want to give you a very brief history of the earthquake engineering. Perhaps um, some of the things we do now, where, is the, where are the roots of it? Well, the professional, if you will, the earthquake engineering really started in, after the 1908 uh, Messina earthquake in Italy. Uh, there was a commission formed after the earthquake. Some buildings survived and some buildings did not to figure out what made them survive. So the, the commission looked at these mostly masonry buildings actually, uh, with slabs and other elements, and found out that, well, we know what's happening dynamically, but it will be too much for the engineers or who would be designing these uh, structures. So let's imagine that rather than we are dealing with the dynamic distortion movement at the base, we'll tell them, the ones that survive, how much lateral force they can take. They found that it's about 10%, a little over perhaps 10% of the weight applied, about 12%. So they said, well, if you design a building, imagine, the, calculate, the, the estimate the weight of the building and apply it laterally to your structure. And if your structure looks like it can take that load, it should be good, 10% of the weight. Well, that 10% of the weight, the idea is coming, of course, even though they know that it is an acceleration or dynamic response, they said, oh, we'll, we'll just go with the, uh, we'll just go with the load. Let's forget the dynamics too much for the engineers. Now, what then came 1933. So there were several years. Um, this is 1933. I don't know if you if you knew it, but that was the first year we found we had a, a record of a strong ground motion. Uh, turns out from Los Angeles, Long Beach earthquake. All of a sudden, we had more information. 
there's increased interest. That time, the same year, 1933, Westergaard, who was a colleague of Hardy Cross and uh, advisor to Nate Newmark, published a couple of books, not as a papers, uh, one page and half a page, actually, uh, two papers in the United States. And he said, hey, we should look at this in terms of velocity. He didn't say not acceleration, but he said, let's look at it in terms of a velocity, because it relates to energy and other things. And then at the same time, the same year, he published another paper um, on how earthquakes propagate, earthquake distortions propagate in structures. And I'll just show you this, that uh, the distortion comes at the base as it travels up the structure, it reflects from the roof, comes down, reflects from the base, goes up. Of course, there's some dissipation going on, some um, a transmission going on. And he identified that this is also related to velocity. Uh, this is really the way propagation, way of looking at uh, structural response. Now, if you just write the equation of the strain and do a little conversion of the parameters, you realize that the, the strain at the, in the the ground story of the structure is proportional to the ground velocity and inversely proportional to the shear wave speed which is related to the stiffness of the uh, structure. So the higher the ground velocity, the higher the strain is going to be. The more flexible your structure, the higher the strain going to be. And of course strain is ultimately what really takes down our structures. So this was the thinking in 1930s and there was uh, interest from Japan. There was major earthquake, Kanto earthquake in Japan, and several buildings that were very stiff survived, and there were paper, a couple of articles published in the United States, but that was the thinking. And then comes this, um, and I will show you what happened, uh, but this idea of <coughs> if the ground is accelerating, maybe we can represent the demand of the ground motion on the structure in the form of forces, floor forces. F equal to MA type of thing. Then if you apply that, you'll get the displacement afterwards. So the thinking is, let's convert everything into force, the, the, the demand into force, apply on the structure, and then we'll find the displacement. So let's treat the force first. Displacement comes last. Now, I think around the same time, 1930s, 1940s, um, response spectra idea came about. Um, Morris Bio at Caltech uh, did a thesis on this first time and then George Hausner at Caltech uh, looked at the, the ground motions and they said oh, maybe we should represent them in a, in a very simple way. Perhaps you're familiar with response spectra but it, what it is is it's a simple single degree of freedom like a lollipop that has a period and a damping ratio and you shake it with the ground motion that you observed or you imagine what happened, but in this case observation based, and then you look at the maximum motion it did in displacement, velocity, relative velocity, and absolute acceleration. And then you change the lollipop, you make it taller or shorter, you change the period of it, uh, keeping the damping ratio the same, you collect part of these peak response parameters, and when you graph it, peak response versus period, you get the response spectrum. It's a very engineering way of thinking, rather than it, expecting the engineer to run a ground motion through, um, for analysis. By the way, back in the day, I was told, I heard from um, George Hausner's writings, and George Hausner, not him directly, but uh, I knew him. Uh, he, was a, he was alive when I was a graduate student at Caltech. Um, it took about 24 hours, 12, uh, 12 to 20, well, over 12 hours, to calculate one of those points manually. The, you know, the numerical time-stepping analysis that you do for a record of, say, 20 seconds, he said it will take about 12 plus hours. And they invented a mechanical torsional um, spectrum generator that cut the demand um, by factors 30 or so, 30 or 50 or so, so they were now able to generate, so that was big time excitement. Now, this idea of spectra took hold. It took, by the way, until 1980s before it got into the code, in the United States at least. And when it entered, it entered in this form, because, you know, 
spectra looks very different for different earthquakes, could look very different. Uh, so rather than that, it said, well, let's come up with this very simple representation. There's a, a peak ground acceleration. When you don't, we have a very stiff rigid structure, it's peak ground acceleration. It quickly jumps to a, a constant spectral acceleration, peak absolute acceleration, with some factor alpha, whatever that may, that may be. And then there's, a, until some period, there's this zone of nearly constant, or in this case, constant spectral acceleration. But then it decays. A couple of periods, T1, T2, and then other things happen. So as you can tell, now the thinking had moved to peak ground acceleration. Not the Westergaard's peak ground velocity, but took this peak ground acceleration. Everything is based on PGA, peak ground acceleration. Well, in the 1950s, the peak ground acceleration was about a third of the gravitational acceleration that recorded, observed in, during earthquakes. 1960s, it went up to 0.5 g, half. 1971, San Fernando earthquake, we measured 1.25 g. Right? Now, you can imagine the engineers who were doing things with 0.5 g all of a sudden, they said, we are 2.5 factors off. 2011, earthquake in um, Sendai in Japan, 2.8 g in the ground. What do you do? Should you take the, the, all the buildings you design using that spectra out? Because all of a sudden it's possible that you may get almost 10 times greater accelerations. Now, one of the most uh, um, impactful sayings of Professor Sozin is that uh, while the scientists need to know what they know, you know a patient comes, they observe the patient, they need to know what's going on, Engineer needs to know what they do not know. Because we design, particularly in earthquake engineering, we design things that are yet to happen. And we cannot be sure that they are going to happen. We don't know what they are really going We have an idea, but we don't know. So we have to really um, think about that. Now, and the follow up sentence to this, of course, it is not that what we do not know that hurts us. Right? What we do not know, we do not know. But it is what we think we know, but it is not so. It's, it's a saying that, that it kind of, when, it, when you realize it, it it's, uh, puts you in a loop, so to say. Um, so let's come back to earthquake engineering uh, design thing. What's the primary parameter we should consider in seismic design? Is it force? I apologize, I, I think there's a slide that I'm, I'm going to go here. Is it force? or strength, so-called strength-based, force-based thinking, or is it displacement or drift? Drift is lateral displacement of the um, structure or floors relative to the ground or maybe the lower story. Should we consider, think about forces up in the structure, even though we know that there's no imaginary force flying and happening during earthquakes, should we design based on that or should we think of displacement? To answer before that, I want to show you a few foundational studies. And most of these were done uh, by uh, Sozin and his students. One of the first ones was Takeda, 1970. Uh, he was very interested in replicating response of reinforced concrete uh, lollipops, a single degree of freedom, to understand how reinforced concrete structure, um, you know, the hysteretic loops happened. And he did a lot of tests on the uh, earthquake simulator or shake table, which was the first uh, fully controlled shake table in the, in the world, which we now at, at Purdue actually we acquired it from Illinois. And he came up with this very elaborate set of rules where if you start and you load the structure, unload the structure and reload, how does it happen? And they were very careful in, in tracking all those things. And they really replicated what they observed, the physical experiment, that's very simple lollipop, um, and uh, the simulation. You cannot really tell which one is which. Now, about this, um, Professor Sozin used to say single degree of freedom uh, simulations, very much like spectra. He said it's simple enough there. It has two advantages. It's simple enough that you can do it. But it is so simple that you don't want to believe it. So you are again put in a loop of asking questions. You always ask, is this really reasonable or not? 
Now, the observation from Takeda's tests and simulations that the, uh, the, the more, uh, the, the, even though they increased the intensity of shaking, they did several tests, the force remained constant. The force in the, in the lollipop that goes through the node is constant. You can imagine why, right? because it's yielding, right? When it's yielding, you cannot really put more transmit, more distort or force up in the structure. While doing so, the drift increased more or less linearly. So they doubled in, in intensity, whatever that uh, intensity may be, I'll show you what it is. They doubled, the, they showed that the drift was doubled while the force stayed constant. Now, to that, to, today to us, it may look obvious perhaps, but when you're doing into heat of the thing and the, you have an objective, right? Um, even though they made the observations, they stayed with this one. Later on, Professor Sosa wrote this, uh, that Takeda and his co-workers, he was the co-worker, and Nielsen was the co-worker, the two professors, so uh, he just called them, uh, called himself and his uh, professor's co-workers, so it's Takeda. He said that uh, they were preoccupied with force, because they were trying to get this force displacement hysteretic loop perfectly, and they were looking at that, but did not emphasize that there's a direct relationship between intensity and drift independent of the strength, right? If the force is staying constant, no matter what you do, pretty much once it's going inelastic, strength is irrelevant. That was 1970. 1979, another student, uh, Haduk Checha, did a series of experiments. A 10-story scaled structure. Not a, you know, just a, by the way, the tests are the test of ideas, not test of structures, really. He had two of these, twins, pretty much. He took one of them, he shook, it, shook the, the building a few times, once and twice, kind of almost yielded, and he set it aside. He took the other one, shook it once, increased the intensity, shook it again, yielded. Did the yield again the third time, fourth time, bigger, higher intensity? Did it six times. So when you look at the structures after shaken twice and shaken six times, the damage state, if you will, were very different. And then they shook them with the same intensity, highest intensity ground motion. So you started the last motion, two different structures, really in the state matter, state of damage. And here's the response that he saw. It's very difficult to tell the difference, right? If the peak displacements were the same, yeah, you may say that there's something changing with the frequency of the period of there, and, but in design, you look at the peak response, peak demands, right? So, started the, you know, born the same way, went through different history, if you will, at the end when they were shaken by uh, the same motion, they had the same response. Now, at about the same time, uh, Dan Abrams, another student of Sosan, did a different series of tests, uh, similar frame, but there was a core wall in the middle. A, a wall, structural wall, no, I shouldn't say core wall, structural wall. Uh, what was different about this, the, in one experiment, was heavily reinforced. These are longitudinal reinforcements as cut. And the second one is rather lightly reinforced. The gross dimensions of it, of the, the, the wall, are identical. Shook them with the same ground motion, and Here's the response. To look at the peak response, they are the same. So strength didn't matter. Assuming, of course, you have some reasonable strength, which you typically get for gravity design. So, is it the force? Is it the drift? Which one is important? Well, about strength, what Sozin wrote, Sosa wrote, says, look, the structure generates the forces it can. It is not loaded, but it loads itself. The stronger it is, the larger the loads that they will load. And most importantly, it's not the engineer, it's not the structure, but the, uh, not the earthquake. The engineer is the one who determines the magnitude of the forces. In earthquake engineering, 
displacement, distortion comes before force. Distortions for it create the forces, not the forces that we imagine laterally applied creates the displacements. So you should be able to design your structure to whichever way you want it to behave. That's one something actually is missing in the design. The design says do this, do that, you're okay, you're off the hook. But if you're designing a structure, it's your, your baby. You better know how the baby is going to behave when it grows up, right? And you may as well also know maybe it will die. And you need to know the ultimate state of your structure. Now, Sozen, Professor Sozen published uh, a paper in 1980, and for the first time, uh, you will see it from the title, actually, um, he just looked at drift control. He didn't call it drift-driven design, as we call it nowadays, but it was drift control. So he was talking about the Hausner intensity of the test that uh, you know, Takeda did, which Hausner intensity is actually peak ground velocity proportional, so it's a peak ground velocity. And then he said, you can use the, uh, uh, you can find the maximum displacement is correlated with the linear spectra. Linear spectra, not nonlinear spectra. And uh, we, uh, pointing to Abram's test, he said, well, the reinforcement didn't really matter. Displacement. And he said, look, as Cross said, uh, strength is essential, but otherwise unimportant. You need to have the minimum strength. But beyond that, it didn't, didn't matter. And he said that it's the same thing with, with the ductility. So our primary parameter of concern is really drift, not, not force. And that is really what um, Sozen stated ultimately. We need to do, think about displacement first rather than forces and the strength. But it feels like, well, how are we going to do this thing? I'll show you. Now, 1984, a few years later, Shimazaki did some simulations, and another student of Sozen. He wanted, they wanted to see the effect of what we call the hysteretic behavior. The inelastic, in the first one is the elastoplastic hysteretic behavior, the second one is more typical. Uh, the fourth one, for example, is a pinch, so-called pinch, due to uh, slip in the, in the bond. Those are the kind of things. Now, they wanted to see how it would display this different uh, structure with different hysteretic behavior is going to respond to earthquakes. Now, I'm going to look at uh, two of these, the most typical ones, and you know, and accepted ones. And these are, by the way, are very similar to the ones that, if you read the American Society ASCE code, the minimum loads and design requirements, uh, the law of the land in the United States, uh, the commentary which you should read, not the code part yet, uh, just a commentary. Uh, they talk about the same thing. Here's what they found. So looking at the number two first, the two is 31. I need to explain this, uh, the graph a little bit. Uh, what you see here in the vertical axis is the ratio of a, a structure that had this hysteretic behavior uh, characteristic how much it displaced to the displacement if we had a structure that had the same initial elastic period that the initial elastic period of the structure, um, but remained elastic throughout. It didn't go inelastic. So it is a comparison of inelastic response to elastic response. If it is greater than one, you say that inelastic went too far or high. The horizontal axis is the strength ratio. Strength ratio is the ratio of the strength of the, uh, um, in the hysteretic behavior, your element, compared to the strength the elastic element would require to remain elastic, or the maximum strength uh, force it will develop um, if it remained elastic. Now, there's a third parameter here. I know it's a little busy. Uh, let me see if I can get my mouse. There's a pointer. Okay, see there. Uh, it's this ratio. T is the period of the single degree of freedom that at that elastic behavior or, or uh, inelastic behavior. I'm sorry, hysteretic. And Tg is like the the period that where the nearly constant acceleration switches to um, the nearly constant velocity. T2 in the design spectrum, very close to that. Now, almost. Five of these graphs look very similar, maybe not this one. But what it's saying is, if the period of your structure is not too short, not in this 
constant acceleration region. As you change, for example, take this one, or take that one, let's say, take this one. As you change the strength of your structure, as you lower the strength of your structure, say from one, this was elastic, let that go down, to very, very small strength, only 10%, 20% of the elastic force that would be required to remain elastic, your inelastic displacement didn't change. Doesn't change. It's pretty much the same peak and elastic displacement. In a very short period, when the structure, your structure is a very short period and has very low strength, you do have an amplification when it goes inelastic. But otherwise, your inelastic response is no different than your elastic displacement. So, by the way, he observed, they observed, Shimazaki observed the same thing with the other one, the pinch one with the slip and all sort of bond, uh, all sort of things that complicate when you do a nonlinear dynamic analysis, for example. Pretty much the same observation. So, the observation they wrote, if you are exceeding the characteristic period, which is, again, switch between the uh, uh, nearly constant exertion to nearly constant velocity. By the way, this is also this corner of the TG uh, characteristic period of the ground is the where the energy input from the ground motion starts leveling off, if you want to go and look at the details of the paper. But the hysteretic behavior doesn't matter. Hysteretic loops that probably you hear uh, from certain uh, camps, quarters, that it's all about hysteretic energy dissipation. It is not. It doesn't change the displacement. Now, Bonacci did later, much many years later, that uh, more tests, they wanted to see more information. Uh, really, a single degree of freedom that the, the, what you look like a beam there is, is the controlling the stiffness, the period. Um, we did a lot of tests and uh, they looked again, this time the period of that single degree of freedom versus the ground motion dominant period, if you will, and the displacement um, displacement of the, uh, of the, the, the single degree of freedom uh, to the displacement of the ground. And they found that uh, it has a very nice linear relationship. Well, there's a complicated but, but if you follow just a straight line, you'll be on the safe side. So there were all sorts of ideas chosen and, the, and his students were exploring, all with the goal of estimating the drift, inelastic drift, in buildings. And that's the tool that the engineer needs if you are going to do a design based on drift. Now, I will show you how you can do it. Up to four structures, up to three seconds or so. Uh, because later on, it, it actually gets better, it, it simplifies. Now about this, people would say that this is wrong, you can't do this thing. And uh, well, if you follow the code and the estimate drifts, and then you do simulations and, and things, you may not also be wrong, right either. So about that, Professor Sozin used to say, if you are going to be wrong, let us be wrong the easy way. Why do we need to go through the hoops and this and that? So I'll show you how we can do it. Single degree of freedom, again a lollipop. And we are after peak inelastic displacement, the distortion in that single degree of freedom, in this story. If you imagine a single story building, and as it's the ground moving, you know, the building is moving, and I want the maximum distortion I, my columns are going to see. Right? Now, we know from elastic theory that the spectral displacement, the peak, elastic displacement, relative displacement, distortion, can be expressed in, the, in terms of pseudo-velocity, peak relative velocity, um, divided by the, um, the circular frequency of your system. Now that peak um, pseudo-velocity, or the pseudo-velocity at, 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 at the period, say T1, the fundamental period of your structure, or any period, that could be expressed as the peak ground velocity scaled. And I can write the circular frequency in terms of the natural period. I get that expression. Now, I, I guess I need to tell you what this um, factor is, Fb, the scaling of peak ground velocity such that I'm going to get the pseudo velocity at the, at the period I'm interested in. So here's a, a typical, this is from Newmark, 
a typical um, spectra in a log log scale, just to illustrate. The vertical axis is the peak relative velocity a structure with a, whatever the period or frequency in this case. Now, on this scale, if I plot the peak ground velocity for uh, this earthquake that generates this spectra, or for which we generate this spectra, uh, if you look at the pseudo velocity, the nearly constant pseudo velocity, it's just a scaled version of it. So you see this, this range where the, the velocity is not changing that much. After all, in design, we don't look at these little peaks and dimples and things like that. Uh, there, there's a scale of FV. And what is that FV? Again, this is well known for a long time. Newmark, when he was de trying to come up with design guidelines for nuclear power plants in the 60s, early 70s in the United States, he had about uh, two dozen ground motions to work with. He did all these simulations single degree of little lollipops with different damping ratios. And he looked at the response and he, the response spectra, and he just came up with this near the constant acceleration, near the constant velocity regions, and near the constant displacements. And then he compared them to the peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, and peak ground displacement. He found these factors. So if you look at, for example, a 2% um, damped single degree of freedom system, um, he has two tables to sets of uh, data. One is the median value, the other one is the uh, a little bit, statistically speaking, a little bit safer mean, mean plus one standard deviation value. So if you are looking, for example, that factor we need to scale the peak ground velocity to get the uh, pseudo velocity uh, for 2%, for design it will be 2.93. Okay. Uh, if you are looking for more typical rather than for design what an existing structure might do, you may look at uh, a factor of two. Okay. So if I come back to this, Fv, which we said is about three, ah, probably we are going to be wrong anyway. Why don't we say that it's close to pi? We cancel the pi. Right. So now we have an estimation for the spectral displacement, elastic, not inelastic yet, it's peak ground velocity times the period that you are looking at, or you're interested in, divided by two. Now, when uh, Takeda, way back when, uh, sorry, Shimazaki, when he was looking at the, uh, the data, when he wanted to organize the data, he realized that instead of an elastic period, if he used a period a square root two times, the, uh, the elastic period, the data looked better, kind of related better, correlated better. So if you add the square root 2, now we are getting what we call the spectral displacement uh, based on velocity in the inelastic response, or for design purposes. That square 2, of course, cancels square 2, uh, part uh, square 2 in the denominator, so you get the answer. So inelastic peak inelastic relative displacement of a single degree of freedom, which had an initial elastic period of Tn1, is simply the peak ground velocity divided by square two and times the elastic period. As simple as that. Now, there are certain uh, restrictions to this in the sense that if you, are, you have a very short period structure, uh, or, and also of low strength, and you happen to be very close to a fault, where you get high velocity ground motions, pulses, uh, this re linear relationship doesn't hold. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a tweak you need to do, without going to detail, I'm not going to show you the details, but Öster did a thesis in 2003, which was uh, to express that one, if this is uh, the base shear coefficient, what we call base shear coefficient is the, how much lateral, force, if you will, uh, it can develop your structure, it can develop as a fraction of the weight of your structure. And if it's really, really weak, it may, it may actually look a bit, you need to increase a little bit more. But these are short period structures and, and again, very special setting. So, again, coming back to this um, estimator, which we call, Sozin called, and we call the velocity of displacement. So inelastic displacement, thinking of a designer, what my structure will do 
uh, mice, in, in this case, at the particular period. And the spectral displacement. Now, does this work? Obviously, you have to ask. Does this work for different earthquakes? We need to look. So here's an earthquake, very typical, uh, used El Centro earthquake. The two horizontal directions, the spectra generated for 2% um, of the critical damping, so the 2% damping ratio versus period. Okay. This is elastic. By the way, you can do it. Here's the plot. It works. Here's another earthquake, Northridge earthquake, a different earthquake, different character, thrust fault, also works. Here's the 2011, I'm sorry, 2011, yes, earthquake in um, Japan. That's good at the, it also works. Now, does this work all the time? No, it doesn't work all the time. Uh, if you have the ground motion that's kind of uh, almost like a, like a Mexico City where you have a dry lake bed and high amplifications of some strange things going on, no, it doesn't work. But otherwise it works, because that's the, not the kind of information uh, neither Newmark worked or we work with. Uh, so obviously in engineering, things work until they don't. Right? So, okay, so this was for the single degree of freedom. It gets better. What about multi-degree of freedom structures? After all, we don't design just huts, right? We, we design multi-story buildings. How do you do that? Multi-design, multi-degrees of freedom. Peak in elastic roof displacement estimation we are going to go, or from which you can estimate your story. All right, so the roof displacement, when the structure is responding in the fundamental mode, which is the dominant mode really, when you're looking at roof, is that spectral displacement at the peak value, uh, the, uh, the uh, inelastic response for single degree of freedom, inelastic response at the uh, fundamental period of the structure, and a factor, this is the, um, related to the um, uh, modal uh, force factor, if you will, and then there's a mode shape factor at the roof. Don't worry about it. it you know, that multiplication is actually, you will see, is a very typical value. So instead of uh, STV, spectral displacement, I can use this velocity of displacement, let's release velocity and peak route velocity, and I'm keeping the same. Now, this combination is typically uh, a factor, we use a uh, tau there, and that tau is generally in the order of 1.2 to 1.4. For moment frame structures, 1.2 or so. For shear wall structures, about 1.4, maybe 1.5. Well, how about, how about if it is square root 2? Yeah. Square root 2 is 1.4, close enough. Right, we're approximating. Now, if you want to do full blown, then you can keep that factor there. But if you use uh, um, square two, here's your estimation for the roof displacement. Give me the peak ground velocity, give me your fundamental period. Their multiplication gives me the roof displacement. It's a good estimator for design purposes. Now, if you know the roof displacement, you can divide by the height of the building, you get an average so-called mean roof uh, drift ratio, how much it displaced relative to its height, so it gives a kind of a, uh, you know, tilt, so to say. And a nice rule of thumb if you are, you know, want to do something quick on the fly, you may say that, look, the building is not going to nicely uniformly distort. Maybe there will be a concentration in a story. Typically in the ground story it happens, actually, or maybe the second story. How about a safe estimate? I'm just going to bump up the average by 50%. That's a very good estimator. By the way, it works. If you hear that an earthquake happened, your structure, how is it doing? If I can get the peak ground velocity, I can, I can estimate. Now, if you don't like this thing, you can actually go full blown, use the full formulation and everything, and you can do um, a detailed one. Now, does this work? I must say, of course, you always have to ask, because we have all this sophisticated software, uh, out there, should we not use those? Okay. Here is the um, a series of um, tests. Uh, our graduate students, researchers, and Pratik Shah uh, was one of them, um, and published a thesis just last year. Uh, did at Purdue. What I'm going to show you is um, a set of data where experiment was done 
either a single degree of freedom kind of a lollipop or multi degree of freedom structure. And then the horizontal is the velocity of displacement based estimation for the <coughs> drift ratio. If we are perfect, we'll be on that line where there's one to one match. If not, we'll be away from it. If the measure is higher, if we have been un in a non conservative or you know, we're not safe, we'll be above, otherwise, we'll be down below. Here's how the data looks. With pretty much nothing, there's no being an, an idea about the fundamental period and the peak ground velocity, and maybe the mode shape, if you will, you can get this one. Now, of course, you're going to say, how about if you, I do sophisticated analysis? Here's a sophisticated analysis result. That takes about, if you know the peak ground velocity, that could take anywhere from 10 seconds to maybe 10 minutes. If you need to estimate the mode shape using you know, um, radius quotient approach and things like that and so on and so forth. Uh, this would take full-blown nonlinear modeling of your structure. I don't know how many hours or how many days it may take and run through it. So coming back, if we are going to be wrong, we better be wrong the easy way. And in design, you know that you cannot be right. There's no right answers. Strictly speaking, there's a range. Within range, if you are safe, you're, you're good. Now, I want to show you results from uh, applying this. Uh, they did a test in the uh, world's largest earthquake simulator e-defense in Japan, a 10-story structure that had frame in one direction and uh, frame and the wall at least the first seven stories in the other direction. And they shook it with very intense motion. Big structure. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really massive uh, table anyway. Uh, here is a typical floor, 13, 14 meters by uh, 10 meters roughly. We have the data for scale, the columns and everything. And uh, you can go through an exercise of radius quotient, for example, uh, to find an estimation for how much, what's the fundamental period in the frame direction, about two thirds of a second, and the dual uh, structure, which is the frame and the wall structure, about half a second, a bit stiffer. Okay. Uh, here's the base motion acceleration. Uh, he said, uh, how about the velocity? Give us the velocity too. So somebody integrated, they said, ah, it's about very intense uh, displacement, uh, velocities, by the way. Uh, in general, we design something for 30 to 60 centimeters per second on average. Even though code doesn't say that you can apply this technique and inverse analysis, so to say. Okay, so good. Uh, we're going to apply velocity of displacement based estimation. Now, we're going to use the uh, mode shape factor, by the way, uh, and as well as the uh, so the factor tau will be the whatever we estimated during our analysis from uh, radius quotient. This is for design purposes, we have higher, higher scaling factor. Now, if I'm doing an estimation, I may also have a, you know, I said, I'm not, I don't want to go mean plus one standard deviation. I want to be in the median ballpark. Uh, that turns out there's another factor squared two, so rather than square two in the denominator, it's just two in the denominator. Okay. So the tau factor in the frame direction turns out to be about 1.2, as we were thinking. Uh, we picked the uh, 90 centimeters, and the, uh, and the and the and for the median, it's slightly less. 30, you know, we estimate that the displacement should be somewhere between. 50 to 35 centimeters. If I'm designing, I'm going to design it for 50 centimeters. I'm estimating that. So it could be 50. I could still be wrong. You know, we have that feeling that we could always be wrong. You should always have that feeling as an engineer anyway. So 35 to 50. It's a dual system. Uh, the tau factor is closer to 1.4, so 1.35. Uh, I'm using, by the way, the large uh, uh, peak ground velocity, maximum peak ground velocity. Uh, and the and half a second fundamental period. So that's for design purposes, for um, estimation, maybe 30. So 30 to 40. Here's how the structure responded. You see that the, the connection and the building, of course, sways. The connection was already 
uh, a bit uh, cracked and everything damaged before they started the test. Let me show it again, if I can. Can I do that? I'm scared of doing this. I'm going to go this way. stood up. But here's the response at the roof, the displacement. Part 46, 32. You remember what, how we estimated? We were guessing 35 to 50, 30 to 40. Not bad. Not bad for such a simple estimation for a thing. You can apply this to a different light. Actually, we did uh, apply this in Mexico city in 2018 when they were telling us the ground motion at the base, they have instrumented several buildings and we were telling them literally on the fly, we we're going with you know, 40 story building, ah, probably your period is about you know, 4 seconds or so if it's a moment frame, it is maybe 2 seconds, 3 seconds if it's a shear wall building and a big ground, boom, 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 and we were matching their observations on the fly, you can do this almost in real time. Again, it may not always work. But in this particular setting, even in for Mexico City, it worked. Now, is this applied every, you know, all the time? Well, they did actually in this test in, in Japan, they changed the ground motion intensity, they doubled it, tripled it. And, and the line that you're seeing, yeah, there's a linear relationship. So they were observing what Sozin was observed almost 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and in a smaller scale. And by the way, this is for the world. So it all comes. From that, the one that's uh, yellow, which we call the um, velocity of displacement. Now, if it is not too late, I want to show you one application. Not, uh, not an application of this, but the idea of this drift. And uh, now we realize that it's all about drift. Right? So I'm going to show you something else but it's related to drift, because drift is what causes instability and ultimate damage and severe damage and possibly uh, collapse in your structures. So if we can control drift by making our structures stiff, balancing it, if you will, proportioning our elements, uh, we will keep the damage small. Uh, probability of local failure is small and then um, we'll be okay. <coughs> now, so here's an application of it. A rather interesting in the background is the applications they mine. Ranking low rise buildings uh, in vulnerability to earthquakes. Say you're an engineer and you are told that find the ones that are not good and fix them. What do you do? You go one by one, analyze each structure, perhaps, right? Or if you have, say, a dozen buildings, maybe you can do that. Or if Maybe a few dozens, you can do that. How about for a city? This is Nepal. Um, probably you say, I can't do it by myself. I need an army of engineers to help me do this. Because in our mind, we will say, ah, I'm going to go one by one, assess every single building, and bad apples on this side, good apples on this side. That's what. If you do that, you will realize very quickly that you have a huge uh, engineering service to, you know, to deliver this thing. You need a, an army of engineers to do this thing, and you need a lot of funds to do this thing. And not only that, pretty much everything would look like you need to fix, uh, which will probably kill the, any political will you may have. Right? Typically, this kind of thing happens after earthquakes, because everybody is heightened alert. For a few months, everybody is saying, we are going to go and fix our buildings. We'll be good. We are ready for the next one. Rarely it happens before an earthquake because they say, well, if it hasn't happened, why should it happen during my time? I'll take the risk, I'll spend the money for something else. That's the typical thing. It'll be like this. Of all the buildings, typical application, engineers try to find the really good ones and everything else is bad. And you end up with requiring fixing everything, pretty much. Except the very, very good ones, but whatever that means, good ones, it's like meets the current code. Remember, we design for tip most of the time for the minimum of the code. Instead, what you should do is 
of all the buildings, you should try to find the really bad ones and fix them first. Because they will probably maybe a small fraction of the buildings, of all the buildings. Maybe you can find the funds, maybe you can convince the, the mayor or the governor, whoever, or the president. And, and the rest will say, well, they may fail, but hey, I'm going to focus on these ones. So this tool that I'm going to show you is really to help structural engineers spend their time efficiently on the real buildings that are likely to be in trouble. Maybe, maybe not. The engineer has to do detailed analysis. The index we use for that, it was developed by Sozin and the postdoc Hassan, um, Dr. Hassan, so we call it Hassan Index. And the, uh, they looked at data from an earthquake in Eastern Turkey in 1992. And uh, they said, uh, well, you know, the buildings are many, many, many buildings. Now, how do you represent the building? Very much like how do you represent an earthquake? They said, okay, we're going to do two things. We're going to represent the building based on what we call the column index and the wall index. For each building, you have these two coordinates. So one and a 2D plot, if you will. What are those things? The column index is the ratio of the effective cross-sectional area of columns at the ground story. You, you should really repeat this for every story, but we'll do it at the ground story. That's the typical problem. Divided by the total floor area above ground. Okay, so this is very much like how much column, how many, how much square meter of, or square centimeter of columns do I have versus the total floor area. It's a proxy, if you will. And similarly for the walls. Affect the wall area to affect the, the total uh, floor area ratio. Now, column index is that. So you, you go and look at all the columns in the ground story. And cross-sectional dimensions, very easy to do. It's very geometric. And then you divide by the total floor area above ground. Now you can do that again for upper stories if you want to do. Um, and the wall index, uh, by the way, you take sorry, half of the columns. Imagine how the columns are working half this way, half that way. It's just kind of a scaling. Anyway, we are doing a, a tool coming up with an engineering tool. The wall index is has two parts. The denominator is the same floor area. But the cross-sectional is if you have concrete walls, we look at four walls in one direction because the walls really work in their own direction, uh, in their strong direction. In their weak direction, they're not really that effective. So we look at the, the two, two primary direction, principal directions of your structure. For the concrete walls, we count all the floor area. And for infill walls with masonry infill, if it is from column to column, floor to ceiling, full fill, you count the cross-section area, but you take 90% uh, uh, out. It's not as effective. The, you know, infill walls are not like reinforced concrete walls. So that index, that ratio will give you the wall index. And of course, you need to do it in two directions. And whichever is smaller in the wall direction, wall index sense, that will be the critical direction. The column index is independent of the direction which way you look at. To illustrate, so here's a plan of a building actually from Nepal. If you are interested, in, to get the column index, if you are getting the column index, uh, you look at all the columns. and you scale it by 50%. Right? So I count all these measure, and they're typically, they're typical dimensions anyway, so you can just fairly quickly. Now if you're doing walls, in this case, in one direction, those are the uh, concrete walls, no masonry walls, really. We count 100% of those, and then we look, uh, sorry, there are masonry walls, so there are masonry walls here. The ones in yellow, we count only <coughs> One tenth of that area, and that will their sum will be the wall index in that direction. But it turns out that in this structure, in the other direction, is much weaker, if you will, in the wall index sets, much fewer walls. That's the for each building you have a column index and a wall index. Okay, just a tape measure you can do this. Then you want to relate, of course, these individual buildings to the damage state. Now, you may say that, well, I, I haven't, they haven't seen an earthquake. Well, that's the thing. We are going to calibrate uh, this index, Hassan index, to the buildings, uh, to the damage, uh, or the structures, not necessarily damage, structures that had seen an earthquake. 
So it could be light structural damage, um, nothing really flexible, uh, moderate, maybe some hairline cracks and spalling, a little wire wider than hairline and spalling of concrete, no collapse, no local collapse either, structural failure, no instability, or severe, it could be a um, structural, local structural failure or collapse, partial or total uh, collapse. So that's the part we are going to be interested in. Now, we calibrate this index. It started in 1992, but with many earthquakes, we go out in the field and we look at the, uh, we sometimes sketch the floor plan and we take pictures and everything and we look at the damage state. Now, this has been done for many, many earthquakes. All around the world, it started in Turkey, but then Peru, Pisco, Venezuela in China, Haiti, um, we have a lot of data from Haiti, 160 buildings, Nepal, Taiwan, Ecuador, South Korea, all over the world. Buildings that are designed by different earth engineers, built by different people, and designed for using different codes. I mean, you can imagine the, the variety, diversity of the possible outcomes, right? Uh, we have data from 1,100, over 1,100 buildings. Some of them we have even the computer models the engineer used. Some of them we have nothing we have to sketch ourselves. Now, all that information, by the way, is public. We share everything, all the papers, all the theses that come out of this. It's the data center, hub.org. You can go and download the information. Again, Excel files, the photos, the reports, the field notes, everything is there. So, how does it look? I'm going to plot buildings on this grid. The column index versus wall index. Okay. Percent, because it's the, 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 the numbers come out pretty small, actually. Effective cross-sectional area divided by the total floor area. We'll start with Arzenjan, the 1992 earthquake. This was a magnitude 6.7 strike slip earthquake uh, within 20 kilometers from the city where this data came from. Here are the building that had seen light damage. Flexure. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of spread around, but we have some information. Here are the buildings that had seen moderate damage. Um, spalling and um, you know, beginning of certain things. And here are the buildings with severe damage, the, the little red ones, and the ones that collapsed. Now, Frozen added a couple more data points from his observations from Skopje, 1963. That was the first earthquake he did the reconnaissance, and also from 1971 San Fernando earthquake. So those two data points are there. Now, when you look at this data, you may, you may see a few things. Sorry. There we go. Um, it looks like there's a trend. So if I put two trends, two boundaries, thresholds, if you will, kind of separated the really bad ones and separated the really good ones, right? So this is really looks like good ones, a few of them, and these are uh, the bad ones fall under this very simple threshold. The, the dashed index, again, I'm not sure why this is not pushing. There we go. Oh, I don't want that. Um, this one is the column index plus wall index is 0.5%. The lower one is 0.25%. Now, so if you are trying to identify the really good buildings, those will be the ones. And if you say, like a typical engineer says, ah, oh, everything else is bad, you have that. But then you will end up with a lot of bad buildings, right, that you need to inspect in great detail. Well, it's like a tough job to do. So instead of that, we're going to look at really, really bad buildings, like we should, so that we'll tell the engineer, look, these are what we have seen in this city. Go and look at the other buildings that may be of a similar character uh, elsewhere. I'm going to look at that. All right, so back to Arzegan clean. So I'm not going to show you data from the other earthquakes we have seen. Next one is the Dusje earthquake. It looks like a mess, perhaps, but you can perhaps tell that as the column and the wall index sum decreases, you are seeing more and more damage. You have seen, you are seeing some buildings that are probably, um, you know, moderate damage or even light damage. Now, there's a, a story that, you know, uh, 
just because your building there you know, didn't see damage doesn't mean that it's a good building. Maybe it was a lucky building. And uh, it's like they say that the, uh, when a soldier comes back from the war safe, doesn't mean that the soldier was bulletproof. Maybe the soldier was lucky. Right? It's possible. This is 2003 earthquake, bingo. Here's uh, from Peru. From Manchua, China. From Haiti, a lot of data points. From Nepal, a lot of data points again. But you're seeing that they're all there, the bad ones. From Taiwan, Ecuador, and last is South Korea. Now, I'm going to show you all of them, step by step. Here's all the data from all the earthquakes, different countries, you imagine. All the light damage buildings. Here's the ones with moderate damage and the ones with severe damage. Now, some of them seem to be spilling over the threshold. We agree. I mean, if you go to this higher threshold, again, remember, you end up with a problem that is untangible. Intangible. You can't, I mean, un, uh, infeasible to fix. So you cannot do and inspect and fix all these buildings. You cannot do them. You have to sort them in vulnerability so you can start from the really bad ones and then do what you can do best. So based on that, I have a few observations. Observation one. Turns out that of all the red points there, three quarters of them are below that first threshold. So we are going to miss some of the really bad ones, but uh, we are going to capture three quarters of them. Observation two is if you look at all the buildings under that threshold, of every two buildings, and say I'm going to inspect those ones, and we are going to, by the way, this is from observation, but now we are going to project it for structures that are yet to see earthquakes, intense earthquakes. If I look at those buildings, out of two buildings, one of them would be damaged. If what we had observed in many, many countries, in many earthquakes, different fault structures, different design of construction, one of them will get damaged, or at least probabilistically speaking. Again, it's not a detailed probabilistic, this is an engineering approach. Or if I take the reverse thing is, if I fix those buildings, even without looking at them in detail, I should, but if I don't look at them, by fixing two buildings, I'll be spending, I will be saving one and maybe improving one. Who may not, who might have been, which might have been lucky to begin with. That way, this way of thinking, by the way, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the complex. If it's really complex structure, footprint, you may spend more time, but um, any, even a high school student can do, right, with a tape measure, and you just take measurements, and we can collect this data. It's very, very simple. Um, you can actually identify the really vulnerable buildings and then help the people. Ultimately, our job as earthquake engineers is to help the people because the structures we design are going to stand, we want them to stand for years, decades, safe, so that people don't worry about it. Um, so with that, I just want to show you uh, the summary of it and thank you for your time and attention and I'll be happy to take questions. And again, you can ask in English or in <laughs> Serbian. Thank you. Thank you. So please, uh, we'll start with the Q&A session. Uh, you can raise the questions in English, but also in Serbian. If uh, you feel more comfortable, please start. I will translate it to Professor. Somebody has to start. Yeah, I will start. All right. Just to uh, let's yes. say spin the wheel. Uh, so here you show us this uh, simple way or the way based on the uh, drift uh, design or drift determination of the drift uh, into the direction of designing the structural components of the building yeah. or the building itself. Really it's load bearing, load bearing. Yeah. But uh, did you perform some studies in, into the direction of non-structural components? Because 
We know that today it happened that the damage in the earthquakes of the non-structural components takes more costs, sometimes even lives, yes. by falling and uh, damaging failure uh, in the structure, especially in the commercial buildings, also hospitals, you know, more, and uh, mm -hmm. hotel so on. So did you perform any studies in for non structure For non structure components with with this uh, drift based the simple mm -hmm. uh, let's call it uh, drift based uh, design and or if you would have any clue what would be the result uh, in that direction. So two things to uh, thank you for the question. Um, we by the way we collected from the Hassan Index surveys, we collected damage state for the masonry walls as well. So, because typically when people build masonry walls, they build them flush to the columns and sometimes not flush with the uh, ceiling, so partial height, so there's captive column condition or short column condition, some people call it short column condition. We actually had that data as well and we found in Haiti at least, when you had uh, non-structural elements blocking your, your columns, for example, from freely behaving as you intended to design, flexural design, uh, the likelihood of severe damage, which is shear failure, uh, increased by 60%. Yeah, so there's one thing. So what to do about the non-structural elements? Well, the, you have to obviously connect them uh, to the structural elements in such a way that they are not going to interfere with your structural elements, which is a difficult thing to do. Uh, but it could be done, uh, depending, uh, depending on the setting. Uh, like in Peru, they are doing now for school buildings. Uh, they used to have this code in the code for many uh, years, but they applied actually recently, and in, uh, 2000, um, in 2001, there was an earthquake, Arequipa earthquake, and we had very good data. Uh, by the way, earthquakes in Peru are magnitude 8 events, and typically it's huge and uh, everything. So what they did is they built a frame, it's very stiff, they actually increased their stiffness between the previous code and the, the code that was in, that enforced at that time uh, by a factor of five. And they, you know, in the US we, we say that under the design level earthquake, if your structure, you know, can take no more than 2% drift ratio, you're good. <coughs> in Peru it's 0.7%, 1% or, or, or even less. What they did is they built these frames so a frame and an infill wall, but they left two and a half centimeter separation. And they filled it with uh, elastomeric material so that there's no environment. There's no even hairline crack in these buildings. I mean, and they are used actually, these are small two-story buildings, uh, school buildings, but they're used as emergency centers because um, other buildings were damaged. So uh, you have to be very careful with, with the architectural elements. First, if they interfere with your structure, the structure that you imagined and you design is not the one that is there. So that's one thing. And then, and certainly, and you're absolutely right, um, actually uh, another student of uh, Sozan looked at the, they surveyed engineers, Japanese and US engineers back in the 70s, uh, what level of drift and how much damage they expect, uh, or is good or bad. Turns out that engineers and architects architecture engineers, which are the really structural engineers in Japan, they said, uh, by the time you hit 1% drift ratio, your structure is no good. Your infills will be damaged, and the, the expense it will be so prohibitively high that you will not, um, you will not, it's, it, it's meaningless that your structure looks good, but I can't use the building, and I need that money. Um, by the way, the, the cost of, typical cost of uh, structural elements, or in your bit, materials we use in, in design to the total cost of the building, including the, you know, the contents, is 15-20% of the building. Now, if you have a, house, a hospital, that's actually less, because the equipment that you put in the hospital is so valuable, right? Um, there could be much less. So, stiffening your structure and making it really um, ductile and, 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 and stiff uh, will probably increase the price by about 1%, 2% of your structure. Maybe, maybe you know, depending on the case, it looks like more. But at the end, you get this safety and reliably, uh, in a way that it is, the economics is, is better not to be damaged, right? Uh, and don't live under this risk of losing everything, including your life. So that's, that's the thing. Just to add, 
to the good that uh, maybe uh, you have a talk with some of the members of the committee of the new Euroco. For example, there there is no fight for the drift limits exactly for the some of the non structural components and some drift limits are uh, proposed even in the range of 1.4, 1.5%. They will lose everything. Yeah. That's I, I can show you pictures actually. Yeah, we all see it. Yeah, we, 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 we this, the, the test we did at the bottom map, we, yeah, by quarter percent actually. Technically we know it, but I think it's five from the industry. But then it's Correct. So, the, yeah, that's, yeah, there's a trade off. Yeah. I think there's a question. I'm going to try to ask it in English. I have one question about the method that you explained at the end uh, uh, where we determined the stability of the building by calculating the column index and wall index. Uh, does the height of the building uh, uh, matter, matter uh, in that method or is it just uh, the, for a low st story buildings? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, this actually, we use it up to seven stories or so, typical buildings. If you go taller buildings, there could be other, you know, higher modes come into play. This is mostly really very simplistic in that sense. Um, and there could be some additional overturning modes, I, maybe that's what you are thinking of instability. Uh, so we use it up to seven stories. Yeah, and we use it, by the way, professionally, I used it professionally if, um, for a U.S. State Department. American State Department, when they want to lease the property, they typically want to inspect it. Uh, at least back then when we had only the Turkish data from Turkey, earthquake uh, buildings in Turkey, we used it as a first pass very quickly. It's a half hour yeah, when you have to draw it. But you're right, uh, it's up to seven stories. That's why yeah, you have to be, uh, for taller buildings, uh, we don't have enough data to begin with. Uh, and, but there are other issues with the tall buildings that this won't necessarily capture. But it, would, it might still be a good guide. Thank, Thank you. Very good question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, when assessing the energetic structure, uh, how lenient uh, of an approach can we take in terms of uh, floor plan uh, irregularities? Because that's the thing uh, that complicates, drastically complicates the analysis, let's say the traditional way. Correct. Um, these buildings, some of them had floor plan irregularities. So everything is in here. Bill, you show uh, the example of uh, oh, Japan. calculating the uh, column and wall index. It was slightly irregular. Shear walls were placed on the. Oh, the. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me see if I understand you correct. Are we talking about this one? We didn't consider it. We just looked at that. Yeah, you're you're right. It could actually make it worse if you have uh, torsional effects or other things. Which uh, actually, when we are in the field, sometimes we observe things. The, the observation that we started doing about Haiti started after we realized that maybe this is. Maybe there be a way to quantify uh, how how the torsionally unstable structure uh, can be. So the analysis will let's see. This base was of 1,100, uh, yeah. yeah. In this base, you have uh, irregular. Uh, we have many, many irregular. We have everything. Very regular, one story buildings to. Right. Could, could we, uh, I mean, is there a way? Uh, is there a way to include that? Uh, could, could we make, find a way to say, uh, well, this building uh, cannot be assessed in this simple way? We, we have to do a full 3D analysis in, let's say, um, I see. Is this possible that this may miss? Yeah, is, is it possible this may miss? They, it might miss because you may have a very awkward everything focused here, but there's such an irregularity that you know that it's going to fail. This method will be blind to that <laughs> because it will say that oh, I have enough column index and wall index, I'm good, but even though it's not. So you're absolutely right. So this doesn't necessarily catch all the bad ones. But it catch the really the, but the, the can you take the relatively lenient approach. This is relatively lenient, but it's very simple. You have to do a trade. This building would require a three D analysis if we do it the, the standard way. That's true. That is correct. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the idea is actually a very quickly way of sorting them to give it to the structural engineer. Say that look, 
you better pay attention to this building. And they may say that, no, 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 this is fine, good. Or yeah, we need it. Yeah, they, all the way to the full analysis, there could be some soil conditions. I mean, we are not looking at the ground motions. Everything is, you know, it's, this is such a simple method that it has everything there is in the mix. You're absolutely right. So the idea is to sort it quickly to the expert to help save the experts time so that they don't wait. Now, some of those bad ones could look like good, so that's a risk we are taking here. You're absolutely right. Quite right. You're welcome. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Actually, one, one more question. Because there are uh, long discussions or fight between the force-based design and displacement-based design. And uh, some people would argue that the force-based design gives the conservative result at the end. Of course, not always, but what would be your answer to that? Honestly, I, I don't know how they can say related because when you go really in, a, you know, in trans motion, things go inelastic. So when they mean force-based design is the, uh, the R factors, the redundant, you know, the so there are researchers and also papers, you know, and I was in Chile World Conference and there were two keynotes, it was interesting, they were discussing like force base versus displacement base. Yeah. At the end, displacement base won, but it was a fair fight. It was a fair, well, um, I mean, when, when you go inelastic, if I give you the force that the, the building experience that went inelastic, and I ask you how much it displaced, you won't be able to tell because it could be anywhere in that force displacement curve once it starts yielding. Um, I mean, by the way, there are some certain elements, now, by the way, the, the non structural elements like uh, ceiling tiles and this and that may be sensitive to acceleration, so they might be doing so. But I don't think, I don't understand how they can defend force space. When you, it's when we are. Safety factors, additional. So oh, but those are. Take into account. Yeah, but those are, you know. Those are modeling in their models in their mind that if they calibrate properly, it would work. And if they have enough information, the problem is uh, we we put displacement, the current thinking, uh, even in the code. Even the code confesses that I couldn't find that particular code. But the code says, "Oh, estimating the uh, displacement is so complicated. That's why that chapter 16 or 12 or whichever one, 21." is so elaborate and there are so many methods. Yeah, but the engineer needs to start with something, right? Once you have an idea about the initial design, you can refine it. That's the challenge. Uh, you have to have the engineer. So I, you know, I, I think it's, it could work, but I think it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you, I think, I think this place is, I know it's unusual because we are so trained in the code way of thinking. Yeah. These imaginary forces, pushing your structure, it's not. Your structure is displacing because of the distortions. Yeah, well, space the real method that we can measure and see. Correct, that's true. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, we took the path that went with force base and acceleration and everything, um, but it is, it's not. So this way, again, this is a tool, and it's not necessarily going to work all the time, but at least it will give you a good start, saying, I don't know, this is not going to work. My, I need to improve my structure, stiffen it up, or something like that. Force-based design is a, it is it creates a different model in the mind that is not real. Now models are not real, right? So um, it's based on calibration. But I think this one, displacement-based thinking, uh, is closer to what we what really happens, at least from behavior point of view. And I think it will have, it will be helpful. Yes, please. Um, so I didn't quite get it, but um, is there uh, an interference between these indexes and the magnitude of the earthquake? Ah, good question. You look at the magnitude range. It's not just the magnitude, of course. It's distance to the fault, right? Also matters. Uh, anywhere from 5.5 to magnitude 8. 
Some of these faults are strike slip faults, some of them are thrust faults, all sort of faults, uh, and all sort of distances. So, not really. It's, it's actually, it really is all, it looks at so many different buildings in so many different settings that uh, I would say uh, that, that loses its, so to say, accuracy, if you will, but at the same time it gives you a general accuracy that it applies everywhere. By the way, that, the fact that thresholds 0.25%, it was established in 1992. Sozan and uh, Hassan regret suggested that let's use a quarter percent. And we kept it. We actually played with the, um, the slope, about not 0.25 to 0.25, a bit different, about, you know, you don't improve it much. I mean, you can tweak it, but then it will become a, a, you're playing with the data to, you know, get something out of it. It's, it's holding, it's, it's stunningly holding. It's just, we are surprised, but now, we can now, we did actually um, train a couple of engineers from Myanmar over the internet, one hour. Small presentation on this. So the, from the ministry, this happened uh, many, many years ago, six, eight, eight, ten years ago. They went out into the field for two, three days. They collected data from field to 50 buildings. And we can immediately tell that, oh, your buildings look like the buildings in Duzje, Turkey. So this is the thing. They're better than the buildings in Haiti. So now, when, you know, the experience in after an earthquake, by the way, if you use this index, it will be very helpful. The experience is, oh, the good buildings behave nice, well, and then the poorly built buildings behave badly. Well, you don't need to go to an earthquake site to say that. It, it, that's always true. But when you start, and when, by the way, when we go out in the field, and from the data you can tell, we don't always go and look at the, the buildings in bad shape. We also look for the buildings in a good shape. In that it's performed well to see if there's a threshold, maybe. So you have to do the. You can actually tell that the, the buildings start separating from each other, the, the good ones and the bad ones. And again, sometimes they're identical. It, it happens. There are theses on this um, from Bingo. Identical buildings side by side. One of them is this way, rotated, rather than that. One of them is damaged. The other one is not damaged or they're identical building in the same orientation. Again, one is damaged, the other not damaged. Or some really poorly built buildings, they're not damaged. Those ones we, we try to study separately to see if there's something we are missing. Uh, so one of the things is this captive columns. Uh, let me see if I, if I can. I'll show you. A lot of images, as you can tell, here. This is a sorry. Uh, let's see. This is an infill, and, and, but uh, well, yeah. So here's what we. So we, this is a three-story flat plate building, uh, flat slab. I'm sorry. We did at the lab, full scale, with solid brick infill. We pulled and pushed. Um, at quarter percent, we start seeing a, a damage in the, you know, in the cracking in the wall. About one and a half to one three quarters of a percent. There were holes forming in the. And what you look at the building, uh, the, the columns, maybe you can tell. Some lines here, diagonals, there, zoom in. We started developing shear uh, failure, shear cracks, so called shear cracks. Here's an observation from Haiti. This is coming to, because when we start seeing things, we said, ah, we need to collect this information. That's why in Haiti we started collecting, when we look at the building, is there any captive column? What I mean by captive column is this. So you see the columns, there's a column here. column here, column there, and another column here. Right? That one doesn't look good. It lost its axial load capacity. So if they were all like this, well, it's the same column. It's the same cross-section, and I bet it's the same um, amount of reinforcement they put. Um, it looks much better. But you see that the, um, what happened is it's restricted this infill, an architectural feature. It restricted to um, flex only over this short height. So even though it was trying to generate, develop its plastic moment, MP, because of the height, the shear had to increase. So it, that's about a third of the height or a quarter of the height. The shear force that develops at the time of MP develops is actually four times 
if it had the, the one like flexible there. Now, how, could, how bad could this be? Just to show you. Here's a school building from Turkey, Eastern Turkey. Uh, they built template buildings. You see these columns there. Some of them are fake, some of them are concrete. Um, here's the building after the earthquake. Collapsed, lost first story. Thankfully, it happened early in the morning, so there were no you know, students in the, no kids there. Now, here's the um, similar template in a better soil, in the same area. And by the way, this is uh, Professor Sozin inspecting. We're out there in the field. Look at those. Very much like it's the beginning of the failure, but thankfully, ground motion stopped. So you look up, you see this cracking there. And this is a fake one, this is a real one. So here's the, you see the diagonal forming? It's sheer failure, so it's not like so. Uh, now we are looking at, when we, when we are surveying, we look at, is there a capital call? Yes, no. And we have this little spreadsheet, uh, and that's uh, field sheets. You just sketch on it and collect the data. And you know, that capital column condition, very obvious, starts here. By the way, it can develop. These are hollow clay tiles, so-called. It's very brittle, uh, it's supposedly light. The, look at the, the capital column formation during the earthquake, dynamically developed, because it failed here, it failed there, there's a soft zone, immediately it fails there. So you have to think of these things. We have some methods, we have some you know, research uh, done, and thesis actually written on how to consider these in whether your structure is good or bad. Uh, but uh, this condition can be developed, by the way, even during a, um, uh, when we have solid walls. And just to give you this, this is the same building I showed you before. This was a school dorm in the same earthquake <coughs> in eastern Turkey. Um, over 80 kids died in this building, including the teacher staying with them. And the and identical structure we found elsewhere. Look at the captive columns. And nearby, this is I'm just a, just, just, this is the building that collapsed. This is a school building, another school building had lost four school building, and this is the teacher's lodge. Um, this one, no damage. Why? It had structural walls. It had shear walls. All they had was kind of shaken and things were all over the place, but not the damage, except the parapet that the roof fell off. All the teachers came out live, all the kids died. So, you know, you have to, you have to really consider consider these kind of things when you're designing. And in the United States, the structural engineer is responsible to consider all the elements, including so-called non-structural or architectural elements, interfering with the structure. So when you do the frame and the, you know, the structure, and then you just give it, if somebody does something later on, of course, that's a failure uh, of the, the, the quality control, but uh, you should consider those things as well. And, uh, Again, ultimate goal is to, to build safe structures so that people don't worry about their lives or well-being or livelihoods. So. Question? Question. Yeah, please. So you showed us how this method in example is applied to already existing buildings. Do you perhaps use this method to observe the projects of the buildings yet to be built? Perfect question. Yes. And, and I will tell you because I, I met, uh, in 2011 there was an earthquake in Eastern Turkey, I get to travel, and I met a student, no, not a student, a young engineer who was working for the municipality, and he told me that he's using this method when somebody submits a report, uh, a project to approve, he would just quickly do Hassan index and say, no, no good, add more walls. And the walls, by the way, is you get more bang for your buck from the walls than anything else. And I said, how? How did you find out this thing? His teacher, instructor, was at Purdue when he was a PhD student and had a class with Sozin, Professor Sozin, that he heard and he taught his student and his student was applying. So yes, we applied. Actually, that's exactly what, um, um, yeah, I mean, existing structures, they have those things when they are coming up with retrofit. That's almost the same thing. We say, no, no good, not enough. There are other things you need to consider in a retrofit, but absolutely, this is a 
really a tool even a city engineer could do, you know, because they don't really know, honestly. It's very, very difficult for them to visualize everything, but it's a very quick check you can do. Absolutely, it applies. Uh, and said, said that uh, you had a condition to not observe buildings over seven stories. Say. Yeah. Uh, were there any more conditions when you built your sample when, when observing, or were there situational? I mean, random buildings. You not found really. Seven seven stories is really because after seven stories, the higher mode, second mode, might come into play. So we are basing it on most more of a fundamental mode. So that's, that's the only reason, but there's really no other condition. And, and it's reinforced concrete building. I mean, there could be other kinds of steel buildings, but, or masonry even, where we have something trying to, trying to do something for the masonry, but masonry is a very complicated structure. It's, well, I mean, uh, and there you have to contain the uh, kind of ratchet things. If you can limit your masonry structure, would survive, actually, most of the time. But, uh, uh, but it could be applied even on wood, wood frame structures and other structures, but it needs calibration. By the way, everything needs calibration right, in engineering. It's not theory. Any other questions? Okay. Right. If we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank you for coming here for so far and uh, sharing this knowledge of interesting and simple uh, methodology and I hope we see it other again for some new lecture to our students. I'll, I'll be delighted. Uh, thank you very much. It's so far but it's so close. I, I really feel at home here and uh, I, I, Professor Marinkovic uh, had a chance to show me around. We have a beautiful city. Uh, I, I love it. And as I told my, my wife, this is my scouting tour. Um, so we'll come back. My contact information, um, uh, let me go. Uh, sorry. Um, there. Um, you, can, you can find, I don't know how to do this works. Yes, correct. Well, or uh, Ihan, A Y H A N, at purdue.edu. You can write to me if you can't access any of the documents, any papers, or any link. Or if you have questions, please feel free to, to do so, and I'll be happy to, delighted to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you.